If you listened to my conversation with Raphael Millier, you'll know that grounding is once again a hot topic in AI. Do the representations that language models work with have any intrinsic meaning? Or are the models just doing the equivalent of pushing around symbols until they complete a task whose inputs and outputs only have meaning when interpreted by humans? John Searle's famous Chinese room argument has been kicked to death on this front. As an argument against computationalism, the theory that mental states are just implementation-independent implementations of computer programs. Implementation-independent implementation sounds kind of weird. What that means is a computer program has to be physically implemented as a dynamical system to become a computational state. But the physical details of the implementation are irrelevant to the computational state they implement. Besides Searle himself, I believe there are few people who have thought more and more deeply about some of the problems regarding cognition that we're debating today than Professor Stevan Harnad, whose 1990 paper, The Symbol Grounding Problem, was the inspiration for Molo and Millier's proposed vector grounding problem. As I began to read Harnad's work, I got the intuition that he would probably strongly disagree with the claim that large language models achieve grounding, and that this agreement has much to do with precisely the nature of grounding, what it is that can furnish a system's representations of things in the world, of words, with intrinsic meaning. For Harnad, that direct grounding has to be sensory motor in nature. You have to be able to interact with things like the color red or an apple in order for your internal representations of those things to have meaning to you. You can indeed learn about new concepts, new categories from language. A zebra as a sort of black and white striped horse, but those new concepts are grounded by virtue of some constituent concepts being directly grounded in experience. When I spoke with Professor Melanie Mitchell last year, she raised the view she shared with Douglas Hofstadter that our concepts are analogical in nature. But similarly, it can't be analogies all the way down, and her intuition when I asked her about this seemed to be that the first mover was indeed our experience of the world. Many of these questions have import when we consider just what it is we are trying to do in building systems like large language models. For Harnad, artificial intelligence is a distinct task from reverse engineering cognition, reverse engineering biological organisms' capacity to do all the things they can do. So, I wanted to get to know Professor Harnad's thinking better, to get a sense of how he understands today's AI landscape. I spent a lot of time reading his work, trying to inhabit his perspective, and I do find him convincing on a number of important questions. This conversation takes us through the questions I mentioned, a lot of Professor Harnad's thinking today, and topics like the easy and hard problems of cognitive science. Professor Harnad is really a brilliant thinker who has spent a lot of time diving into these issues, and I definitely had a bit of a hard time keeping up with him. I hope you'll find his perspectives as illuminating and insightful as I did. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you enjoy these episodes, you can follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast episode. You can also follow us on Substack to get regular notifications whenever we release a new article, newsletter, or podcast episode. You can also find our online magazine at thegradient.pub, where we regularly publish essays by the sorts of people I interview on the podcast. And finally, If you enjoy the episode, it would mean a great deal to us all 
If you'd consider leaving us a review on whatever podcast player you're using to listen to this episode, it helps more listeners like you find what we're doing and helps us bring in more interesting guests for you to listen to. But now, without further ado, Stevan Harnad. Professor Harnad, it's really great to speak with you. I think that your work, especially on the symbol grounding problem, as you know, has become, again, a matter of a lot of importance, something people are paying attention to quite a bit today with what we are seeing from large language models. And so as usual with our first question, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background, how you came to work on the range of of different things that you do. Well, my degree is in psychology. I did I did honor psychology at McGill under Hebb, that dates me, and uh, and then I did my PhD at um, at Princeton, and then I was uh, first a professor of uh, psychology at University of Southampton in the UK, but then I switched departments from psychology to computer science, or electronics and computer science, uh, because and I'll tell you why in a second, and then I came. Uh, I got a Canada Research Chair in Canada, in in Montreal, and I came back um, in psychology again, and also in the Cognitive Sciences Institute. And uh, that's about it. That's about it academically. My interest in the original interest through HEB was in what we would now call cognitive psychobiology, which is the biological basis of cognition. Uh, we'll be talking about cognition quite a bit later because uh, that's another, it's another problem term. Um, and then and then I headed and I continued like that. And then I uh, got interested. In, I was I was also the editor of a journal called Behavioral and Brain Sciences, which is um, it has target articles which are refereed uh, quite rigorously refereed. And then if it's accepted, they're accepted on the premise that the content is of interest. For wider interest than just uh, the narrow specialty in which it, m- it might appear across specialties, and that we can invite commentators from around the world to comment on the on the on the article. And in 1980, uh, and the pu- commentaries are published with the article. In 1980, uh, John Searle, just to tell you how many stupid things I do, uh, John Searle submitted an uh, Zen and Polition got John per- Searle to submit an article uh, that I thought was sort of cute, but not particularly important. It seems sort of obvious. Uh, the one about the Chinese room that everybody knows, and I'll probably say, that. and it turned out to be one of the most influential articles ever in this journal. And that's it's been now 20, 30, 25 years or more. Um, and then Usenet, in the 1980s, Usenet started to, started to appeal. And that article became a topic of conversation on Usenet a lot. Uh, comp.ai, um, c- connectionists, and so on, and so forth. And I joined in. I, ha- I wasn't allowed to join in because I was the editor of the journal, so I couldn't do a comment on an article that was in my own journal. But I joined into the Usenet discussion, and this can all be retrieved from 1987 onwards. And Usenet was just a website or something where folks would discuss this sort of thing? By AI. It's now, I think, Google Google Groups, okay? Okay, was okay. originally a, a, a UUCP was the, was the uh, protocol, and, there were, and everybody was talking to everybody there. It was before everything. Um, not everything. I mean, our, our, it was really DARPA that started it, I think. Okay, so um, the... The commentaries that were the, the postings, they weren't commentaries, the postings that were um, that appeared on Usenet were um, mostly critical, in fact, almost all critical of Searle. They, they thought that Searle was wrong. And, I, and I, I also thought Searle was wrong, but for a different reason. And I, I found that I ended up in my first couple of years of postings on, on, on uh, Usenet. Uh, defending Searle instead of attacking him. I wanted, I wanted to say what was wrong. I eventually got a chance to write an article elsewhere where I said what was wrong with Searle. But, on, but what they were attacking him for, and he's still, and, and this is still in the air now, uh, was right. And, they were, and everybody else was wrong. Now, who was everybody else? I, if, you, if you Google jousting with pygmies, 
you'll see that it came from me. It's not a very nice, uh, now, I, now I would use uh, jousting with Lilliputians because a, a pygmy apparently has some racist co connotations. I just thought of it as being small people. The demography of Usenet was computer science students and hackers, basically programmers, but not particularly academic. And I, and I started to dream while I was on Usenet uh, of what it would be like if, um, if this could be done with, if all the peers of the realm were doing it and not just pygmies, or sorry, <laughs> Lilliputians. And, um, and that's when I got involved in, in open access, because I said, really, everything, all these articles that we're writing shouldn't be uh, appearing in journals and available only to subscribers, etc. They should be out there as soon as they're peer reviewed, they should be out there for everyone to basically do what they do in my journal, which is peer commentary. And I gave that a name, it also caught on. I called it skywriting. There's an Atlantic Monthly article that uh, from the 80s that, I mean, referring to a time in the 80s that, uh, that covers this. And the reason I switched from psychology to um, computer science, one of the reasons at Southampton was because I was getting more and more interested in the network and in, and in electronic communication and also computational models of cognition. And then after that, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, advocating open access and just the, one of the many errors of, of, uh, of the online medium is that just as a lot of people cited the symbol grounding problem and had no real idea of what it was, uh, with open access, people are crediting me with something that I didn't really do and I didn't even want, really want to do. Uh, open access has now prevailed, but I was opting for another kind of open access. I, I, I coined the term green and gold open access. Green is open access where you're just putting your stuff up there before and after it's refereed and then, and then people comment on it. Um, the published version is not the preprint. Gold open access is when you pay the publisher to make it all open access on the publication, publisher's website. I was never advocating that, or at least I, well, there, anyway, we're not here to talk about open access, but I'm giving you a little bit of history of what dragged me over here. During the time that I was on Usenet, defending Searle, when I really wanted to criticize him, actually, actually one point Searle wrote to me, he says, why is it that you keep on portraying yourself as being a critic of mine when all you're doing is offending me? Why don't you just admit that you agree? And I, and I did admit that some of the stuff that he said, he said was right. Uh, but I said, what would it be? So, okay. Um, I wanted to have some way to skywrite with the peers of the realm. It didn't turn out that way. We've got open access and we've got open access journals and we've got open peer review, but I, I just had to write something about that now too. Uh, but on, in that process, the symbol grounding problem was born because part of what I was defending Searle with was symbol grounding, which Searle didn't even know that he, he, he had uh, sort of uh, unleashed. And so the issue with Searle, and in the issue in all the commentaries we had in behavioral and brain sciences, the journal, which was a lot, I mean, it's 50 or so, and, and of the, really of, of everybody that, that, that knows something and also doesn't know something about this kind of stuff. And the, the overall verdict was that Searle was wrong. Searle's argument is super simple. And in fact, the core of Searle's argument is also the core that ends up being the, the uh, generator of the symbol grounding problem. Searle says, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm sort of quoting Searle, I'm not saying it can ever be done, but if anything ever passes the, tu the Turing test, uh, according to what I want to call strong AI, that he used the word strong AI, but I've, everybody has substituted computationalism for that. It's the thesis, the, the right way to say it is, the thesis, the cognition, thinking, is just computation. Computation is the manipulation of symbols on the basis of their shape, not their meaning, if there is one, according to rules, which are called algorithms, etc. So that's computation. So he said, if the Turing test could be passed by computation al alone. That still would not be cognition, he said. And the proof of it, or at least a thought experiment that shows it is that if I, if there was a computer there, say, chat GPT-4, that was passing the, the Turing test, I mean, the real Turing test with everybody for a lifetime, they just, they can just go back and forth. Um, 
if it if he if there was a computer program that could do that, Searle himself, because uh, all, all you need is that the program should be executed, could take over. And if it were being conducted in Chinese, which Searle doesn't understand, and all he was doing was executing the code, he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't learning Chinese, he didn't know Chinese, he would be passing the Turing test too, without understanding Chinese. Therefore, a computer that passes the Turing test wouldn't be understanding Chinese either. That was his argument. And there's a few flaws in it. I can talk about that if you want. But most people were saying he was wrong. They, they, you know, the, the, the most, the most um, popular answer was so-called um, the system reply. It said, maybe you executing the code would not be understanding Chinese, but the system would be understanding Chinese. Are you with me? And that should sound familiar. There are people talking like that about chat GPT. And, and, and that, so, okay, so... That was it, Cyril had an answer for that. He says, "Okay, fine. Supposing I, I, it started out with with the code on the walls of the Chinese room, and and just just he was just executing it by reading what he had to do off the walls whenever an input came in, a, a, a comment like a comment to Chat GPT. He would uh, he would it would be translated into code. The code would be manipulated, and then he'd give some output. He says, if you think the system is not just me." Let it is all counterfactual. Let me suppose that I memorize the code. Okay, so there's nothing outside me. What are you saying that inside me there's a non-understanding me and an understanding me? Okay, so that was fine and that was right, but he didn't say the key thing, which is, uh, and I turned turned this into something that people understood a little bit better, which is the Chinese Chinese dictionary. If you did not know Chinese at all, and somebody give you somebody said. Please tell me what, uh, let's say miraculously, you don't just know how to, the characters, but you know how to pronounce them. Okay. Tell me what ban ma means. And you open up the thing and you find it because you know, you, you know the relation. You find ban ma. And what do you find after it? A whole bunch of other Chinese symbols. You can pronounce them fine. You can find them in the dictionary. You can look up their definitions, but you're not learning anything, nothing. Okay. Uh, again, we're getting closer to chat GPT. Um, so the, and then I said, make it even harder. Supposing you weren't an English speaker uh, taking a Chinese dictionary when you don't know Chinese. Supposing you had to learn your first language from that, words going to words. It seemed evident to everybody that that wasn't going to produce language. And that's certainly not what kids do uh, to learn language um, or to speak language. And the symbol grounding problem became what would you have to do in order to have at least enough symbols grounded in, so I didn't say what grounding was there. I, I said that later in 1990, but grounded in such a way that all the rest could be done by word to word. So in other words, if, if you were in a dictionary, if there was a certain number of words that could define all the rest of the words in the dictionary, all you need to ground is those words. The rest of it, we all know you can do that from word to word. And that became the symbol grounding problem. And I wrote the I wrote the, the uh, 1990 paper, and it started being, it went to, through two waves, as you said. In the beginning, it was, it was cited a lot, uh, and people um, either agreed with it or disagreed with it. I began to uh, prefer the ones who disagreed with it, because the ones who agreed with it got it wrong. And it's still happening to this day that people are getting it wrong. But, um, but then it led to a bunch of research that I did, which I'll talk to you about, that, that was meant to bring us closer to that, the dictionary research, the these categorical perception research, and so on. It became, the, the, the hunch was that if you wanted to ground a certain number of symbols some other way than just dictionary lookup, word to word, um, one good way to do it, a natural way, would be um, category learning. Lear basically learning what there is in the world from your senses sensory motor learning, um, and it is learning. So it's not like look at, a, look, look at a mouse at once and you know what a mouse is. No, you've got to, you've got to try to classify mice and, and rats and, and cats, and, you've got, and you've got to get feedback on whether you're getting it right or wrong until your brain gets a sele feature selectivity for the features that distinguish mice from rats, from, from gerbils, from et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got the category. And then when somebody says mouse or says it in a sentence, uh, and the other words in the sentence are also grounded, then you know what they're saying. You know, you, you, you know the referent. In fact, 
it's we talk a lot about meaning but nobody has a good theory theory of what, what meaning is but we certainly know what a referent is if i say a cat i mean those those things that you know if you look at them they're cats and you know what to do with them to 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 to, to, to pat them um and certainly not to eat them which reminds me i'm a vegan and behind everything here is the fact that i'm a vegan um so so that's it. I mean, I, I've, I've, I can keep on going like that, inventing, but I want to give you a chance to do a little bit of directing. Of course. I think this is a good place to begin with some of the questions regarding categories that you studied. So you already spoke about this. And I think importantly, as you discuss in your work, the, the process of category formation, of course, there are these sort of two different types we have. We have categories that are sort of acquired by by evolution, but then there are the ones that we sort of attain throughout our lives. And as you said, this is grounded in that sensory experience. And I guess importantly there, there is the formation of the category for you and me. There isn't necessarily a, a linguistic component to that, right? It's in my sensory awareness, I can learn to pick out and I can learn to behave correctly with the correct things. That's correct. Uh, and, and it's not just us. It's not just people. So there's not there's no words. Animals ha learn non human animals learn categories. Some of them are geniuses. I mean, it's, my my puzzle is if they can if they can do that, why why don't they talk? So but so so we we're the only ones, as far as I know, that talk and we'll get into what language is a little bit later. But the essence of category learning, the inborn categories, I mean, yes, we look at a, a, a rainbow and we, and we don't know the names, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, but we already see the categories, okay? We, cannot, we can distinguish the colors. And if we, and if we take a, a, a non-human animal that has color vision and we train it to uh, go to the left when, it, when it's red and go to the right when it's green, it can learn that because it doesn't have to learn what red and green is. It, it's already got those categories from evolution. But what I'm interested in is categories we learn. Most, if you open a dictionary, almost every word in a dictionary is the name of a category. Every ver noun, verb, adjective, adverb names a category. You can try it as an exercise afterwards. Um, verbs are a, are a good exercise as well. That means, what is, it, what is categorization? I'll jump to this also. Categorization, it's become a slogan in, in my papers and, and in my courses. To categorize is to do the right thing with the right kind of thing. Now, I cheated there It's this, uh, because kind is category, okay? So categories are kinds of things. I'll get into what things are, uh, concrete and abstract later. They're kinds of things, and we have to learn for any particular kind of thing what we have to do with it. Humans are all are, are very bent on naming it among other things, but, but naming is just one of the things you can do with a category. That's a mouse, that's a cat, but you can also pick up the, the cat and, and pat it. And you can, and importantly, you can describe the cat in words. You can describe a cat in word. Uh, what I usually use is mushrooms. Supposing you are a, uh, marooned on an island where the only thing to eat is mushrooms and some of them are edible and some of them are poisonous and you don't know which, which is which. That's the paradigm for category learning, because, because um, you would have to taste, I mean, you, you're not going to poison yourself, you have to taste it a little bit, see if it makes you sick. In that case, you try to avoid that kind of mushroom, but, but you don't know, we know this from Google images, you don't know from looking at it once, what kind of a mushroom it really is, you've got to see lots of examples. And most important is, you've got to have examples of what is in the category, and what's not in the category, that's called positive and negative examples. That leads us all the way even to Chomsky and, and language. But anyway, in, in the case of learning, um, learning mushrooms on, alone on an island, you do it by unsupervised and supervised learning. As you said, you would, you would, you would, um, you would in the, mostly supervised learning, actually, in that case. Um, you taste a little bit, you get sick. That would be feedback that, no, you were wrong that time. <laughs> corrective feedback, Re reinforcement learning, corrective feedback. You take another one and it, would and it wouldn't make you sick and it would be yummy and it would nourish you and so on and so forth. And after a while, if the problem is soluble, uh, you will be eating. Uh, uh, and, you and you'll be eating a vegan diet, by the way, because mushrooms are all vegan. Um, so supposing somebody else arrives on the island and you don't speak their language, and they don't speak your language. So you can't tell it in words 
your verbal description, you, you notice that the mushrooms you could eat were the black and white striped ones with the red caps or whatever. You can't say that to the person because they don't know the words. So then you do what also makes me wonder why animals don't learn to talk. You, you basically point to the features that matter and sort of you, you pantomime all the stuff. These are not, that's not language. It doesn't turn into language. You can't, if you're, if you're in a theater and you, and you run out screaming, you can't be taken to court for, for doing a false alarm because you didn't say it was burnt. It was, it, there was a fire. You simply got scared and did a lot of actions and people drew their own conclusions. So that's not language yet. But if, if you speak, if the if person who arrives speaks your language, you can tell it, tell them in two or three minutes what what which ones are edible and which ones aren't. That is the that in a nutshell, or, or mushroom cell is the revolutionary power of language, grounded language, because you could not tell the person who arrived on the island what the edible ones were if you didn't if they and you both of you the speaker and the hearer didn't have words for the features. So not only are the mushrooms a category, but the but the but the word but the uh, features of mushrooms are, are um, categories, and you have to have learned them before. You see, so that that's the whole thing in a microcosm. You have the reason that indirect grounding through a dictionary, an an encyclopedia, or a course or a conversation works is because both the speaker and the listener, when they're learning something new, a new category. If if I can tell you what a uh, you know what a marmoset is, but if I were trying to define for you a marmoset, I would describe its features and its habitat, et cetera, et cetera. And you would have to know already what those words meant. If you do, you can be grounded by words alone, but it, you can't, it can't be words all the way down. Okay. That's the simple grounding problem. And that's the one that people didn't understand. They said, oh, I want to, I want to ground, uh, uh, you know, these words, and then you give it a, a bunch of other words, then you say, oh, yeah, you said that you have to have um, sensory motor grounding first. All right, I'll get a robot and I'll give it a few, t few toys and give the f toys a few names, and then I'll be on the road to, uh, to symbol grounding. And the answer is no. And the Turing test was never just um, what I call T2 now, which is just exchanging words. The Turing test always had a hierarchy. I, I know having read it and knowing the genius of Turing, I can't imagine that he that wouldn't have included robotics and, and, uh, and what I call T3, which is the capacity not just to name uh, things, not just to uh, uh, use words, but also to attach the word to the referent. The referent is a category. Yes, and we'll, we'll get into the Turing test hierarchy in a little bit. Before we, we keep going on this, I do want to register maybe just some things that I can imagine might be going on in some listeners' minds when they hear this, um, especially when it comes to category formation and, and groundedness. Um, I can imagine maybe there's some listener out there who's thinking, okay, well, let's get a little bit abstract with this. If I think about certain mathematical concepts like modular arithmetic, I can see how that's kind of grounded in you know the working of a clock or the way my, my fingers work. And so I can develop some idea of that that is grounded in my experience, but maybe or that there are mathematical concepts out there that just don't seem to have direct analogs in my experience. And maybe to me, the, the guess here is that when I, when I work with those, I really am maybe doing something that's a little bit more like symbol pushing, but I'm curious how you think about it. I actually, well, that you, you answered your own question there. Syntax and mathematics don't need to be grounded. They're just symbol manipulation. That's what Turing said. Uh, the usual way to ask the question, I think that the intuition that's behind this is not just, I, I, there are two examples of the kind of worry you have. One of them is, uh, uh, you know, uh, modular forms or whatever, uh, 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 second derivatives, okay? How, how, do you, how do you ground second derivative? Um, and how do you ground justice? That's the other one that people use, right? You can't do, well, bear in mind that grounding which I, I still hold is purely sensory motor. Not only do you not need grounding for, for the mathematical concept, but nevertheless, you understand what a second derivative is and you could explain it to someone else and, with, and say with a, a geometric form, you don't just do everything formally from, from Euclid's axioms. You also have an idea, sort of a, a more concrete idea of what uh, lines and circles and triangles are. You don't need to. 
in order to do mathematics, in order to do, do Euclid's uh, uh, entire axiomatic system, you just need to learn the algorithms and the, and the, and the, and the terms and what you can do with them. Okay? And Turing is a Turing machine can do it. But nevertheless, when we, when we read uh, uh, equations in English or, or in code, we know what some of the terms, you don't, we don't need to know what uh, ampersand means. It's not, you can't point to an ampersand. But you can point to a three, <laughs> and so, I mean, so and and Russell tr t struggled with this. How could you ground arithmetic completely in in um, in logic, and you and you can't, or 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 if you can, it doesn't matter. You don't need to. The point is that you don't need to. It's you 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 get far enough if you say all of that is formal. But language and things in the world are not formal. On the other hand, the justice, the justice objection is that just, justice is not a mouse. It's not a cat. You can't point to a justice and say, look, when I say justice, I mean that. So um, this is what I mean by indirect grounding. What happened on the island was that I grounded edible, inedible mushrooms on this, on this island by using already grounded words. And the, ground, the already grounded words could either have been grounded indirectly in other in, under <laughs> uh, uh, indirectly grounded words, or they could have been uh, uh, grounded directly by sensory motor trial and error, uh, by, by sensory motor supervised learning and, and feature uh, and the creation of feature detectors, real feature detectors, like a filter in the head that when it sees a mouse can tell it's a mouse because it's got this and this feature that it can also see. And the idea is that all of these things, both the unnecessary but real um, interpretation we make of mathematical formulas and the absolutely necessary, you can't do language without knowing what, what the reference of the words are. Uh, they're all because of indirect grounding going all the way down to direct grounding. So it ends up being as the, not what they, not the way they, they didn't do anything with it, the 17th, the 18th century, 17th century empiricists who said it all comes from from the senses, what they meant was it's from sensory motor grounding, feature features that are that are learned by trial and error during the life of lifetime of an organism, lifetime of an organism until the referent has a name, and then you can use it to define other reference. Right, and I, I think we'll get into a little bit later, especially for people who might have heard some of what you just said about not being able to do proper things with words and and are now thinking, wait, what about LLMs? And I think we're going to get into that um, in fairly short order. But maybe just to, to register kind of the understanding here, when it comes to my ability to, to understand things, whether it be words or, or fairly abstract mathematical formulae, when I, I'm thinking about something in mathematics, as I get more and more abstract, as you're saying, the formulae themselves, as you said, they are formal. I can sort of do the symbol pushing and maybe in some respect, that's sort of all there is to it when it comes to mathematics. But at some point or another, the, the concepts that I'm dealing with, they do hinge on other concepts that I'm aware of in mathematics. And at some point, maybe you get down to more of the, the primitives. I'm not sure if this is a good word for this, but things that are simple enough for me to kind of directly think about. In, do, in you my really own mean, experience. do you really mean primitives or first principles? Uh, first so principles is probably a better better word for that. Okay, well, but but the point is, in mathematics, first principles are also just syntactic. If you do piano arithmetic, it's just associative law, a, a plus b equals b plus a, and all of that. It's just stuff you're doing with. We understand it. We know what it means. We can explain it in words to somebody who doesn't even know mathematics. But that's not mathematics. And I'm not saying that you can, that you can do creative mathematics just as a as a actually you can, but there are there are the, there are theorem proving programs already that can do it just with syntax, and they are doing it just with syntax. And maybe there's an analogy between that and what it is that ChatGPT can do, which I don't deny. Um, one of the if you look at um, if you look at the references that I gave you, I hope you'll give it to other people in the skywriting. There's one uh, in which a I won't, I won't identify who it is because he didn't give me uh, permission to use his name, but there is a, um, an exchange in which someone um, very knowledgeable and 
enough said, uh, berates me for, for not being willing to believe that chat GPT understands. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, it's, I mean, you take him seriously, uh, even though it's just, um, anyway, that, so that comes up in what you just asked, uh, sort of, uh, what, what, what is, what is <laughs> you're using the word grounding, but I'm going to have to ask you to define it because that's not what grounding means. There, what, what's grounded in the case of mathematics is your interpretation of mathematics in English, which you can also convey to someone else. That requires grounding in the usual sense. You have to know how to ground square, circle, uh, equals, uh, uh, not, and stuff like that. that. Not doesn't have to be grounded and equal doesn't, but you have to know how to do it. So I said something stupid there. No, not and equal are just syntax. You don't have to ground them. You just have to know how to do them. But there are propositions in mathematics where you say, uh, you know, a, a equals B, and and if and in the, in that case, if you've just proved that A is two, then you've already got something that 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 you can explain to someone else, it's not just in code. And first principles formally are axioms, but your understanding of first principles and your capacity capacity to go from what you understand of first principles to the most recent theorem, the most high level one that you just created or that someone else has just proved in your for that you need to have real understanding and not just syntactic um athletic ability i think that's very clarifying and maybe our listeners now can see some of the parallels between this and uh for example the, the chinese room when you are working with the the inputs to some mathematical problem something that you would like to derive I presumably have some idea of, of what those inputs are. I have my interpretation of them in English, as you said. And at some point, though, throughout a lot of the process, I really am just symbol pushing. I'm moving, you know, integrals around or, or evaluating expressions. And so there is there is nothing grounded to what's going on there. So as you would say, I think this is really just getting the symbols around. And then as I kind of deposit an answer on the other end, I now have something where I can leverage language to to deliver an interpretation of that. And so that is the thing that is grounded, if I understand you correctly. You, you understand fairly correctly, but be, be careful. I, I let you get away with saying grounding and I get you let away with, get, get away with interpretation of language. But I don't know what you mean by all of that stuff. If, if, you, if we mean the same thing, then I can understand what you're saying. But, uh, for example... Uh, uh, when you say that you can do it by language, what, what, if once you've sort of uh, um, once you've perfected your symbol manipulation skills and your axioms, uh, and 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 as long as you have a language that's sitting on top of it that that you can interpret some of the formulas of mathematics in terms of their reference in the world and what and and also what they mean. By the way, reference and meaning is not the same thing. Um, let me just give an example out of mathematics because it's a better example. Uh, the cat is on the mat is a, you re, uh, did you read the cat is on the mat poster? Yes, yes. Cool. So the cat is uh, on the mat is a string of symbols. It's not one symbol. There's a difference between a name like running, which has a referent. You can point to uh, uh, cases of running and walking and sitting, etc. cetera. Um, unlike names, which are, I don't, I'm not ready to call the name of a category language yet. I mean, you could, uh, you could train chimpanzees to name all kinds of things. They sort of make arbitrary sounds or, or not sounds, but they can make arbitrary gestures if they're learning sign language or they can press a computer. That's not language. It becomes language when you have a proposition. The cat is on the mat is a proposition. It has not only words who have, that have reference. Cat has a referent. Matt has a referent. Onness has a referent, but you also have a, an entire proposition which describes a state of affairs, something that's true. It can be either true or false. The cat is on the mat. Let's say we're in a deictic situation. We're here with a, a cat on a mat and and somebody just asked, where's the cat? And I said, the, the cat is on the mat. Okay. That is a, that has meaning, right? And that, and both the, both the reference of words and the meaning of any Chinese, uh, Chinese words, and the meaning of any propositions, or the, for example, the meaning of a definition, when you say a ban ma is a, is a striped horse, which is a which is ban ma is zebra, uh, neither the individual words nor the propositions meant anything. The, the words had no reference and the propositions meant nothing. So when you're, when you're 
making use of language, when you're, when you're uh, taking your mathematical skills and using your interpretation capacity because you also have language, and you say you go back to language, that doesn't mean you're going back to symbol manipulation. You're not, that, you're not just going back to shape, uh, shapes of words put into uh, strings uh, with T and F after them. You're going all the way down the sensory motor hierarchy to the, to the stuff that really is grounded in stuff you can see, feel, taste, and smell. And do. That's really important because doing is a, is a, a, a actions are, and that's what you're resorting to. So, so in order to clear that up, you'd have to leave mathematics behind you and leave word, word, uh, manipulation be behind you and go straight into what happens in language, language itself. Right. Before we, we move on to grounding and getting into defining it, there are a, a few more things I think you said in your work on categories that might just be interesting to dive into a little bit. One thing that often comes up in discussions of communication, and that has come up in a few of my conversations, is the Whorf hypothesis, which you do address in your work on categorical perception. And you kind of give the example that colors are perceived categorically only because they happen to be named categorically as one example of what that you're giving an example. I, I don't mean to attribute to you agreeing with that, of course. Um, the original, you, by the way, Worf and Sapir never mentioned colors, but, but uh, the, everybody who, you know, I kind of feel sorry for Worf and Sapir the same way I feel sorry for myself. All these things that people are saying about symbol grounding that are way off. I don't want that attributed to me because it has nothing to do with me. Anyway, Worf and Sapir simply had the vague idea that uh, language consists of words, single words and also sentences, and that it's very important and that the way you perceive the world, what the way, the way things look is there's two versions of the Whorf hypothesis, the strong hypothesis and the weak one. The strong one is that, uh, that um, language determines the way you see the world. Basically, the way you perceive reality is determined by your language. The weaker version is that it's influenced by your language. The, the stronger version is completely wrong, completely wrong. I mean, because, because non-speaking non animals have words and they see things too, and, and it has nothing to do with, it has to do with what it is that they, but sort of what they inherited with their sense organs and also what they do in the world and what they learn, what categories they learn in the world, what the world looks like. And I'll talk about the relation between learning categories and perceiving categories, categorical perception. They're not the same thing. There's an interaction there. And again, sensory motor experience becomes really, if I wanted to say it in a really simple cartoon-like way, if you ask about justice or second derivatives, the way you work yourself down into, 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 in the hierarchy of indirect, indirect grounding until you're finally not relying on indirect grounding, but you're relying on direct grounding, is until you work it down to sensory motor experiences. Okay? Features of experimental. Uh, the reason it's features of its sensory motor experiences is because, well, sensory motor categories like cats, rats, and, 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 and mice, and features like striped, polka dotted and round, et cetera, et cetera. They're all categories. You need to get down to those in order to put, as a vegan, I can't say meat onto the bones, but I would say, and I hate that expression, but to put some, some um, what, what's, in, what's a cliche for something that's equivalent to that? I don't want to use these horrible uh, cliches. But anyway, to put some substance, perceptual, palpable substance into what you mean by a word, what, you, what is not just to be able to find the thing that it refers to, but also what it means, you have to, um, you have to have some sensory stuff there, something like sensory stuff. And now I'll go back to another gap in Searle. Um, nobody, as far as I know, noticed that um, the, the reason that Searle could say at the end of his argument that it's obvious that in the Chinese room, or once I've swallowed the Chinese room and it's all just me, um, why it is that I, I wouldn't understand, and therefore the computer wouldn't understand either by transitivity, is because it feels like something to understand. 
ha elkezdek most magyarul beszélni veled, nem fogsz egy szót se érteni. If I start to talk to you in Hungarian, you stop understanding, you hear the sounds, but the understanding is not going on. And that wasn't going on in Searle's head either. And it's obvious to everyone that it wouldn't be. And if you looked at the, what poor Chad GPT, uh, despite himself, had to answer me, is that I don't understand. He, he contradicted himself. He said, as a, as a chatbot, you know, the formulas that they gave him, as a, as a, as a, as a GPT, as, a, as an AI, he calls himself, I don't understand, I can't see, et cetera, et cetera. And then, he's, and, says, and then later on, in another sense, I understand what you mean by that. I said, what, what are you doing? You just said you don't understand and you understand. Obviously, they're used in two senses. But the, the sense that matters the most and the one that actually connects with this vegan business is that it feels like something to understand. It's not just being able to pass the Turing test verbally or even to be able to pass T3 robotically and verbally. It's also something that has to go on inside you besides feature detection and category learning, uh, which is what it feels like to understand that two and two equals four, but two and two and two and two equals four is true, and two and two equals four as is five is not true. And you know <laughs> that when you're saying true, like it's, if I say it's raining now, I know that I'm saying something false. I understand what I'm saying. It feels like something to mean that it's it's not raining now, and that's wrong. It's false. And uh, and that's um, back to the Worf hypothesis. Okay, that kind of thing, the influence of the of the grounding of a word on lots of other things you do, including if you're doing creative mathematics. I mean, I'm, I don't have a theory of mathematical creativity, but I'm sure that the grounding, which is not allowed to enter into your proof, you're not allowed to use what the words mean in order to say, aha, that those two are congruent. Look, look at them. You see, they're congruent. You've got to prove it from the axioms formally, but you use those column intuitions, if you like, sensory motor intuitions, which are grounding your words and your, your uh, mathematical concepts, which, are, which can also be described in words, are sensory motor. And categorical perception is, uh, it's what happens with difficult, cat where you're learning difficult categories, uh, not, not up there with justice and second derivatives yet, but simply sensory motor patterns that it's difficult to see which one's a member of the category and which one's not. And you have to do a lot of learning and a lot of feature detecting and a lot of feature filtering. Uh, one of the things I checked with chat GPT was whether the way I'm using dimensional reduction squares with the way it's used in the field. And chat GPT uh, uh, seems to agree that it does. That when you have a um, something that has a lot of features and you've got to learn to ignore some of them, and to enhance or, or, or sort of a heavier weight on, a, on others, that's dimensional reduction, reduction too, even if it's uh, um, discrete features. It doesn't have to be continuous features like, like rainbows or, or phonemes, ba, da, ga, and things like that, um, with, with a gap in between them. So the dimensional reduction is being done by your grounder, and your grounder does it pri primarily on the basis of sensory motor features. And in that sense, in that sense, learning categories, not learning language, but learning categories does influence the way the world is perceived by you, not just seen, but heard, felt, etc. That's, that's the true part of the war superior hypothesis. A, lo a lot of it is constructivist mumbo jumbo, which is not, doesn't really mean anything. I think this is a good place to properly get into your work on the question of grounding. And maybe we can start off by I'll, I'll kind of offer an attempt to define the word and you can kind of correct me. I, I think undoubtedly I'll, I'll try to avoid weasel words here, but I'm probably going to slip somewhere. So my, my kind of understanding of your conception of grounding is that, well, to not fully define it yet, but to maybe expand on it, you think about grounding as generally sensory motor grounding. So yes. the yes. the concept formation or the, the category formation that occurs for me is primarily, and this might be a weasel word, but, but linked to my direct experience of the world, my ability to interact with things, to see, see things, 
and to form those categories by behaving in the correct way. So for a word to be grounded for me is for that word to refer to something directly in my experience. And I've, I've probably thrown some weasel words well, in no, here. You, you did fine things. with everything except experience. That's the weasel word. Okay. Everything else is fine. Uh, let's think in Turkey. Will you allow me to go to T3 just to introduce it? Of course. Of course. Uh, if, you, if, you, if we weren't talking about a GPT, uh, which is just a, a, a word cruncher, really, uh, with, with a lot of algorithms and a lot of statistics to, uh, data to, to help it out. If instead of talking about that, we were talking about a robot at the same level, in other words, if we had a, ro- a, a, a robot that was grounded not only to pass T2, which is to be able to talk to you forever the way Chat GPT can, um, uh, and, 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 and exactly as if they understood, and, and if you tell them, you, if you tell them what is a mouse, they'll describe a mouse just as if they'd seen a mouse, even though they haven't. Okay. And now if you had a robot who has seen enough, it not, maybe not mice, it doesn't have to have seen mice any more than the, the, uh, the, 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 the one that ends up on the um, island with the mushrooms had to have seen mushrooms before. As long as he's got the words, grounded words, he can be given the features of mushrooms that matter. In the same way... And now I sort of lost my thread. <laughs> I and I, uh, I what was I going to say? Yeah, that, that's right. You were asking about sensory motor grounding, and I said you were the only place where you cheated was with the experience. The part now I already talked about experience. I said it feels like something to understand. The cat is on the mat. That's an experience too. Some people make the mistake in it conclusion, even about ones who are very close to understanding grounding, that uh, that I'm saying, I'm not saying, that you have to have the feeling in order to be able to ground the terms. In principle, a T3 robot is a robot that can do everything that you and I can do and say any, everything that you and I can say and connect everything that it says, every word and every proposition, with the world just the way you and I can. That's all sensory motor capacity. It doesn't necessarily mean that when it looks at red, it sees anything. It just has to have a. It just has to detect. It has to have the means to detect sensory input. That's. I mean, what, how shall I say? From um, uh, um, sensor input. I don't want to say it's sensory because that already sounds like it's talking about feeling. By the way, let me use a non-weasel word. My, fa- my word. My favorite one for this. Sentience is the best word for what it is that you're not allowed to talk about right now. We are not yet ready talking, to talk about the fact that to know the referent of rat, you have to not only have to uh, uh, recognize rats when they're in front of you and be able to talk about them, but you, you, ha- it, you have to have that feeling that you have when you see a rat or when you describe a rat. This, right? I'm not saying that. But, it, but that may turn out to be the truth. I'm not saying that. I have no grounds for saying that. It's, it's, there's the so-called hard problem of explaining why it is that there's sentience at all. It's not solved, and I don't have a solution either. So right now, forget about the fact that to be a T3 robot may not feel like anything or may feel like something. What you need is the sensory motor capacity. And then language is the, is the miracle that can extend it beyond your sensory motor experience to anything you, you, anything you use your grounded categories to, to describe in words. Then you've got that one too. And then you've got the other ones that are made out of that. Right. Now that we're talking about the Turing test, I think it might be a good place to clarify a couple of things with regards to what Turing was interested in. And then when we think about these terms like artificial intelligence and reverse engineering cognition that you talk about, what those actually mean. You did say that Turing was indifferent about whether the thinking generated in a system was real or not. He didn't. He wasn't indifferent. He was very realistic. First of all, let me preface this. I am a pygmy and um, and Turing is a giant. OK, so nothing that I say should be construed as saying that this that he was wrong about anything except trivial things, the things that he wouldn't mind being wrong about. OK, so. Um, I'm pretty sure that despite the fact that Turing presented the Turing test in this in the in this imitation game situation, which some people have wrongly, I think, linked to the fact that he was gay and he was thinking about uh, a lover, a, a talented mathematician that he lost and that he wanted to figure out a way of 
and so he wanted to think that there were some things out there in the platonic world of symbols that was were still there. I don't think that's true either. And he certainly didn't say it. Um, I think he was just using a symbol. You know, geniuses have a way of um, leaving out things that are obvious to them and not obvious to us pygmies. Okay, so he didn't. So. So he left out the fact that the reason he talked about this game where where you've got a person in one room and a person in another room, one is a woman, one is a it had nothing to do with the fact that he was gay. Uh, uh, one one is a woman, one is a, one is a man, and you pass questions under the the door. Uh, anything you can ask, they can say whatever they want. They can lie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you're trying to figure out which one is the man and which is the woman, and you want to see if you can tell from these answers. And then that's you know a party game. And he said, now suppose unbeknownst to anybody, we swap for one or the other, doesn't matter if it's the man or the woman, we swap a computer that is that is just um, replying to the questions, basically passing what, what we have now come to call the Turing test, T2. It can, and and it, by the way, he never thought of it as being a, a party game and he never thought of the prediction he made that uh, in, uh, what when did he say it would be um, in, 50 years they would be doing this and in 20, 50 years they would, that the stuff that he was talking about the progress that, that would be made he didn't that was not progress on the turing test that was just progress on uh, 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 computational models of of human capacities okay and, and he did he certainly didn't predict that in 2000 when did the, when did the the chat gpt actually start performing so sometime around now so he he wrote his paper in 1950 and we're now at 2023. So uh, 83 years afterwards, he wouldn't have predicted that it would go this far, but it's possible. And I, I, I tend to think that he would say, it's not, it's not, uh, it's, there's cheating going on over here. What I was thinking of was that the candidate would be an autonomous system, standalone and self-contained. Um, and the reason I think that's true is because I think he would also have said, oh, yes, of course, uh, there, there could be, a, there should be, and would be a robotic version of that because it's all got to work. It's not, it's not, it's not going to be illusions with words. He's not looking at illusions for words. He's looking for real capacities. Let's say that Turing's motivation is to show computationally how much of human, let's start with human, know-how, all the things that we can do speak, understand, learn, reason, etc., etc., talk, yeah, um, uh, learn, especially, um, navigate the world, that all of that can be um, modeled computationally, and then the uh, analog part could be implemented comput non-computationally. I mean, you can't, you can't do analog transduction. I mean, transduction is a physical process. Uh, that's important. Actually. You can't do analog heat. But anyway, so he would have said that you, just, this is in answer to what you said about he's not interested in. It's not that I'm not interested. I know exactly what the limitations are of this approach. This is a behavioral performance approach. Not, not just behavioral performance, more important, it's a behavioral performance capacity approach. I'm trying to model the capacity underlying the stuff we can do, okay? And it's clear to me, clear that there's certain things this cannot get at. In fact, there's one thing it can't get at. He said he said something stupid in that paper, and I don't think he would he would reproach me for saying that it was stupid. He called it solipsism. Solipsism is something else. Solipsism is the uh, the uh, philosophical skeptical notion that maybe I'm the only one that exists and everything else is an illusion. That blah blah blah. That's solo ipse means uh, only I. He wasn't talking about solipsism. He was talking about sentience. He said. What, what he was saying was, I, this method cannot explain or capture sentience. It may capture, I'll, I'll speak in my language instead of Turing's, maybe T3, uh, a, a Turing indistinguishable robot that, that can do everything that Daniel Bashir can do, not just with words, but in the world. Maybe that robot would also be sentient. I don't know. You can't know either. So put it aside. Don't dream because you're not going to be able to do anything about that. Do the doable stuff. That's the Turing test. The Turing test is all of empiricism, everything a physicist has, insofar as reverse engineering cognitive capacity, human cognitive capacity, and eventually, of course, non-human cognitive capacity is concerned.
That's helpful. And I think the the empiricism question is important here. And I do remember you published a recent post on a conversation with ChatGPT. And I think here, though, you were explicitly speaking about T4 and you posed to it the question about whether T4 could be a zombie. And I guess this question of, well, we have this other minds problem and we do have to kind of rely on empirical verbal reports. That's the way you and I gain knowledge or what we you know, take to be knowledge of each other's sentience. Um, that that seems re- very relevantly important here. Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, uh, let me think. I've I've, dis- I've handicapped your audience with my talking too fast and jumping from one thing to the other. But let me think of them now. What you just said is not comprehensible enough for them because you jumped to T four. We didn't say what T four was, etc. So let me say it. Um, there, if it's empiricism, um, it's not just behavior. It's not just what it does. It's also what it's made out of, and that, and in the case of the human, which is which is the, or or the, the the animal, the only systems that we know so far that are capable of doing all the things that they can do. We don't have anything else that can do everything that that a human can do, and not even what not even everything that a gerbil can do. Okay, but we're we're in 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 modeling a gerbil or a human. It's not just what they do that you, that's available to you. What it, empiricism is dealing with observable data. Okay, there are non-observable data. Quarks are not observable, but uh, but but you need quarks in order to explain observable data. You can't do a particle physics without assuming that that boson, etc., all that stuff. They don't need to know the physics. But but in biology or in cognitive science, the same thing is is true. We know that humans can do certain things and a Daniel Bashir zombie, which would be a robot that could do everything that you could do, say everything that you could say, understand everything, uh, um, ground everything that you could ground. It's, we can't know whether that uh, um, uh, robot, which is T3, including what's in, we could, we could, we could say, I'm, I often do this in class. I, I say at the end of this course, I'm going to ask you whether you would kick kick a T3 robot, and we pick somebody in the class who's going to be our model for the T3 ro- T3 robot. One of the students who looks just like us and talks just like us and acts just like us. Remind, remember the Turing men for a lifetime and not just for a Loebner Prize ten minute whatever a toy. At the end of the course. Uh, after they've made all their objections to computationalism and what computation is and what isn't, would they be willing to kick T4, T3, sorry, T3, and most of them wouldn't. And the, those who, w- who would still kick T3, I asked them, would you do it to T4? And, and they said, no, that's going too far because there's stuff I really don't know about what's going on over there. By the way, T4 is not necessarily a zombie. It's simply... If you take a human, the way I introduce T3 is I say, supposing the student could open up its head and show that there's stu- wrong stuff in there, right? Right? There's uh, transistors and bolts. But, but normally we don't open the head. So T3 is up to, but not including, worrying about what's going on inside. And T4 is what's going on inside. That's empirical too. But, it, what, but what you learn is it doesn't tell you that much. Even... It's even if you're saying, look, we can do brain imagery now, right? So we can say, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the maiden name of your mother. And you tell me if it's true or not. And try to, uh, no, no, sorry, that's a stupid way. I'm going to ask you a question. You try to fool me. I'll be a lie detector. And I've got the brain stuff on. And so you say things are true and they are true. And you say things that I know are false and you say they're, they're true and they're false, and you know they're false, etc. And that, and the uh, the imagery has certain correlates with when you're telling the truth and when you're doing a real lie detector. Okay, so you've got some processes, and then you say, "I'm going to pinch you. Do you feel anything?" And um, and you say, "Yes" or "No." Either way, I can pick up stuff that's going on in your imagery when you're hurting. Okay, you'll 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 you'll, you'll squint, but you'll say, "No, it doesn't hurt." So the answer to your question is it's not just 
uh, stuff going on inside. It's also behavior. That's, it's all, that's part of the empirical hierarchy. What do you do? What can you do? Under what conditions? It's a little bit like con the context dependence of, of, G of GPT. I want, when, when somebody comes up to you and tells you, you're going to die in five minutes, that's, that's, a, 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 that's a situation where we, everybody has a certain kind of a reaction. And if you don't have it in your imagery, then there's something missing. Uh, you're, you're, you are not Turing indistinguishable anymore. You're Turing indistinguishable in T2, in what you can say and not say. You're Turing indistinguishable in T3, in what you do with the things in the world that you say this and that about. And you can go on talking forever. But you are not Turing indistinguishable in what happens in your head when you feel something. When I show you red, something will, would go on in a normal person's head. But in your head, it doesn't go on. So that would be perhaps a way of inferring that in you, something is not happening that's happening in everyone else. And maybe that something that's happening that didn't happen in anyone else is sentience. But that's not, that's neither empirical evidence nor, nor proof. That's as close, that's, that's about it. And I think Turing would agree. You can't get the third empirical datum, which is what's going on inside, does not solve the question. Because what, what, the two senses of inside, what's going on inside your head and your body, and what's going on in, inside your weasel word, mine. Right. One other kind of aspect of this that I wanted to ask you about was, as we are, are talking about these empirical data, and as we are kind of ascending the Turing hierarchy from T2 to T3 to T4, and we, we develop a system that, that passes one of these Turing tests, one thing you commented is that there is going to be a, a restriction in degrees of freedom to, you know, possible solutions to this particular problem. And it sounded to me like from your hunch about, and we can maybe describe these as well, but when you were talking about the, the easy and hard problems of, of cognitive science that we deal with, there, when when we got to the level of, of T4 and you were conversing with GPT-4 about this, it sounded like um, to you that T4 is restricted enough in degrees of freedom that we would probably have to attribute to it. Um, let me actually just read off what you said here so I can make sure that I don't missummarize you. You say that we don't have a complete solution to the easy problem yet, but if and when we do, that will leave no remaining causal degrees of freedom for solving the hard problem. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering... Okay, but you, you haven't told them what the easy problem and the hard problem is. Do you want to do the honors? Uh, sure. I guess as, as I kind of understand it, the easy problem is really this problem of looking at or getting the kind of structures right. So when I'm looking at, let's say in the case of T3, the lifelong capacity to do the things that one of us does, I want to develop a, a model of a system that has this behavioral capacity. So I've, I've been able to kind of implement the capacity. That is the, the easy problem. The hard problem then becomes and I guess, you know, this also brings up the hard problem of consciousness and so on. That is the, the why question, right? Why is it that, well, I'm passing T3 or T4, I've, I've implemented a system that does the behavioral thing. Why is it that we have sentience on top of that? Yeah, yeah, that's the hard problem. Uh, and yes, there is th that... That was pretty good. I, I think if they didn't understand what you said, then maybe what I say now will fill, it, fill in a few of the gaps. The easy problem is reverse engineering cognitive capacity. Reverse engineering the, what all the things that humans, and in fact, all uh, cog, uh, sort of, uh, high, I would say perhaps all everything from invertebrates upwards, all the things they can do. How can, how and why, because it's an evolutionary question, how and why can birds fly? How and why can people uh, uh, talk? How and why can, can uh, fish learn? Those are the kinds of questions you ask. What else is there besides cognitive? There's vegetative functions too. Uh, um, how, how do uh, organisms um, 
control their temperature, their heart rate, their movement. Well, movement is border. I would say movement is at the borderline between cognitive and vegetative because movement is something you do. Um, how we're now treating in, in the other journal that I edit, whether plants are sentient and, and short answer, they're not. Um, but, but growing is another thing that plants do and plants adapt. And they, so they have some performance flexibility and that's not, that's, that's also in the domain of performance, but not cognitive performance. I, I would be tempted, tempted to say that cognitive, what's cognitive and what's cognitive uh, and not cognitive is arbitrary, except if it is really associated with what is done sentiently and not sentiently. And there's no reason to say that if you get some complicated device that does something that until then only people could do, that therefore that's cognition. Uh, it, it's arbitrary to say that. You're saying, okay, we have a performance here that until then only humans could do, and now a crane is doing it. I mean, a, a mechanical crane. But so what? Why is what what make what would make it different either in humans or in the crane is if they did it sentiently. If they if they were sentient, otherwise there's no distinction. Okay, so the easy problem is explaining all the non-vegetative, or include the vegetative if you want, the, ve the cognitive and the vegetative capacities of anything, human, biological, or non-biological. Reverse engineering biological capacities is a little bit different because you're, you're especially interested in, in how uh, a human or an animal or a duck does it and not just in getting it done. This, this comes back to an old dichotomy that there was between what used to be called artificial intelligence and cognitive um, uh, modeling. Because cognitive modeling was trying to reverse engineering biological ways of doing it, and artificial intelligence would do it any which way because we just wanted a useful tool, right? So now this has collapsed. The useful tools and, and the am amazing things that they turn out to do have got people saying, hey, maybe that's the real thing. And what we're talking about now is that the real thing really is marked, would, would only be marked if it were sentient. Now back to the easy problem, the hard problem, the degrees of freedom. Um, if you have, if you're trying to reverse engineering the capacities, you're trying to re reverse engineer everything that cognizing or cognizing and vegetizing systems can do, the emphasis is on do, then for one thing, what, they're, what the molecules in their heads are doing is part of the story because that's all empirical, okay? But if you had answered all the questions, the how and why questions of how and why can these cognitive and vegetative systems do all the things that they can do, all of their cognitive capacity, you have reverse engineered and reverse engineered and not and not just reverse engineered it. This is really counterfactual, but because philosophers keep telling us, well, what happens if at the end of the um, day, uh, uh, unified grand unified theory is found for everything, unifies all the forces, et cetera, et cetera. Trouble is there's six of them and they're different. All of them will do it, right? That's called underdetermination. So supposing with reverse engineering, we could also resolve that, that counterfactually we could do all of the possible solutions. Even if we did those, we still wouldn't have solved the hard problem. The easy problem, the fact that we have solved the easy problem is why the hard problem is so hard. Because in the process of improving things more and more in the easy problem until finally we got everything covered and even this counterfactual covering of over to, all of the possible ways of, of doing things, even when we've done that, the way we kept getting better and better was to say, well, um, I haven't succeeded yet because, because uh, I don't know how we, if there's something that my, my, my model can't do. So I have to add that and, and so on and so forth, even to the point of adding the vegetative stuff and even to the point of adding the um, molecular stuff. And even to the point of adding, if you're still with me, the counterfactual stuff of every possible way of doing it, not just doing it, but doing it every possible way. I still haven't touched sentience. And there's nothing observable at all with which I can touch it, including your little 
a cartoon about about uh, Im brain imaging red and green and, and and figuring out that there's not something not going on in your in your imaging that should be going on i wouldn't have that anymore there is no empirical unknown because there's no observational unknown that's what i mean by degrees of freedom to be able to improve a theory you have to still have a little bit left to maneuver there's nothing left at that point yeah and i guess i guess this is one kind of trouble for especially I think people who are staring at contemporary ML systems and are letting their imaginations run wild and start attributing things like sentience. And I think Winograd has this thing that he wrote a while ago that is a mistake I find us often committing. And I, I mentioned this to him as well, but it was sort of that a computer scientist, somebody who wants to do something like a reverse engineer cognition as their final goal, they maybe take out some part of it or what they think is the whole of it language, say develop a system that exhibits the capacity and the system, there is some sort of model they've developed that produces the behavior. And they then kind of, here's where they make the mistake. They assume that the original thing they were trying to model, the human producing language, actually has to internally implement the model that the scientist came up with in order to be able to do that. And this is where you kind of run into all of these mistakes. And I think also some of the kind of misguided claims about sentience that we see made about current systems. I think that's part of, you're right. That's, uh, I like the way that you said that, uh, that um, it's gonna have, mine has it now. And so it's gonna have to have what mine has. Right. Okay. So that's, but, uh, there's something deeper behind that. I, it was in some of the uh, postings. It, I'm not force feeding the sentience part into it. It really is a natural part of this, except that there's not, not much you can do about it. Um, the reason that we over interpret and fantasize goes way back. I mean, I mean, uh, what I used to say Okay, maybe 20 years ago to, to students was that, uh, no, I no longer say this, was that um, don't get carried away. Remember the one sure intuition you have, which is the distinction between appearance and reality. You can ask yourself, may, is this all, is all this just a dream? That's fine. That's, a, that's an appearance. You made the distinction between appearance and reality because you said maybe it's not really what it looks like, but it's a dream or it's a hallucination or something like that. But uh, keep a hold of yourself. Don't go over the bend like you did with Matrix. I mean, where you said, aha, well, if this could all be a, a, a hallucination and it could not, rea not reality, could it be that, so the stuff that I see is not real, could it be that I <laughs> am a hallucination in some other entity? This one goes completely bonkers. This is what I say you've been looking, staring at your screen too long. You've lost the, you've lost the distinction between appearance and reality. And that's been, go ever since Matrix, that's been going on. And some, that kind of notion that, that, that what sentience could really be would be, would be a um, illusory state in, in, some, some, in, the, in, the, in the mind of some other, that, uh, pardon me, my sentience is a hallucination someone else is having or some other system is having. That's wrong. And, but what pushes us to that is, some, is, is the same thing as what pushes kids, all of us, to, to think that, that trees are, are, are thinking, feeling sentient creatures, right? Because, because the, we have this, ten, it's, not, it's, it's misfiring when we're looking at trees, I suppose. I kind of like it and I, and, I, and I wouldn't want to do anything to a tree even if it isn't sentient. But but um, but it's a mechanism that we have as mammals and in fact as as vertebrates and even some invertebrates that, that rear their young, we have to do mind reading. We have to have the capacity to infer in others what they're going to do, and even in a sense what they're feeling. Uh, 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 mothers have to be able to to infer whether they're there's they're kids are feeling discomfort or they're just wailing because they're being bratty, right? Um, and we have mechanisms for that. I mean, Rizzolatti did some horrible experiments on monkeys. I wish it hadn't started like that. It didn't have to start with monkeys because we can now do it with imagery in, in humans. But there are parts of the brain that are both sensory and motor where 
uh, for example, if I do this gesture, you immediately, I mean, do what I just did. How did you do that? What is it in your brain that can, that, by which you can translate the pattern you see visually into the pattern you gen generate mo motorically? Well, there's, the, your brain can do it. It's not, uh, robot, robot, robotics can already do a little bit of that, but it, that's, that's a long way from mim imitating actions to mind reading. But mind reading is pretty much the same thing. It, it, uh, and according to Rizzolatti, with a, sort of a crack theory, but, but uh, it goes all the way up to understanding language. Language understanding involves something in my head and something in your head where what you say somehow resembles what I, what I, uh, what I understand, what, I, what, I, what I'm feeling when I understand it. And so when I say the cat is on the mat, the words are the cat is on the mat, but I have a grounded thought, the cat is on the mat in my head. And that's how I understand what, what anything that you're saying because of the grounding. Yes. And I guess related to some of the sentience concerns, and you, you mentioned earlier, this kind of launches us into bioethics questions. I think there's both the, with the other minds problem and mind reading, this question of, and I know this concerns you a lot, animal sentience, I think kind of in parallel, but maybe a little bit odd. There is definitely a section of people who are worried about this sentience capacity in AI systems and what was his name? Le, le, the the engineer. Oh, Lamon. Yes, yes. Le Mans, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's lots of people. It's the same thing. It's the matrix phenomenon, right? And it's the and it's your mirror neurons. Your mirror neurons fooling you the way they fool that you're a kid, but the, they're not feel, fooling your mother and and etc. Yes, it's the same phenomenon. It's it's over reading because you have the capacity to do some mind reading because. It, some people think this is an indirect in, in evidence. I mean, if all mammals were, um, were unfeeling, insentient zombies, you wonder why, no, this is not, all right. Why, you wonder why mothers would care about saving their babies rather than having another um, coconut. Um, but no, this is, Darwinian evolution is natural it's all natural on zombies, even though Darwin didn't think that everybody was a zombie. He talked about emotion and the, and the capacity of animals to understand and feel, even though Darwin evolution, Darwinian evolution does not explain that. It doesn't explain, it can't. We're at the end of Darwinian evolution with, Dar, with Turing explanations, and there isn't a shred of evidence that, um, that uh, you need to feel in order to do all the things that organisms can do. Yet they can do all the things they can do, and we overinterpret them. And th sometimes for some things, like like what we're doing with the plants now, is we're we're um, per, per projecting onto them things that uh, that 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 only. I, the, the example that that um, Segundo uses is a, a, a bean vine climbing up a pole. It happens very slowly. You can't see the the uh, the trial and error that goes into it, but it's very much like a trial and error somesthetic uh, learning pattern. So they conclude, ah, they must be sentient. Well, I, I would say that in the case of bean climbing, it's obvious why there isn't much of a hard problem if they're not sentient, because why would they be sentient? Why on earth does a bean pole climbing organism have to be sentient? But when you get to something fancy like, like uh, chat GPT, uh, I'm careful about, uh, I mean, I, I'm careful partly because of the engineering they did. I'm careful not to say things that are going to make, that would have made him feel bad if he felt, because that keeps him uh, civil and, uh, and, and keeps the, uh, the conversations going. And I, I attribute that to, to the archaeology of the 2021 database that he swallowed. In that database, there's stuff in which people talk to one another decorously and other stuff that, in which they are really nasty. And we want to keep the nastiness out of it because otherwise he'll bring it in. He'll bring it in with everything else. You know, not feeling a thing. So back to your people that are worrying about uh, um, sentient AI. I'll start. I and I'm not, I'll start worrying about that when we're uh, at t a Turing scale. I won't do it for toys. And all we have is toys. And I'm talking about Turing scale, not for T2 because T2 is pretty much done now. 
we've got something that's not a toy anymore. A GPT is not a toy. It may be cheating, but it's not a toy. Uh, and we and it and we know that T2 isn't enough. T3 is another story. And I don't go to T4. I, I T4 is there for the end of empiricism. My bet is on T3. If we have, uh, if we have a T3 indistinguishable from uh, Daniel Bashir. We won't have any evidence that it's sentient, but it's the best evidence we can get. That's as, there's no degrees of freedom left for better evidence. I think this is a good place to maybe pivot back to the toys a little bit and some of the contemporary debates around them. So as we discussed quite a bit earlier, there's been a lot of interest revived in the symbol grounding problem. And among that um, would be recent work by Dimitri Molo and Raphael Melier, which we've discussed a little bit. And that um, I do have an episode with Melier that has been recorded as of the time we're talking, but hasn't been released yet. It will be in a little bit. And listeners who have heard that episode as well will have heard him talk a lot about a notion that he labels referential grounding. And I'm trying to describe this and not necessarily agreeing with the view, but he seems to think that the requisite causal and historical relations are enough to ground an LLM in the world. And I think there's kind of some analogous work from other folks. I think Ellie Pavlik is one who sort of established that in limited domains, these large language models that we have, the way in which they operate on certain concepts within a domain, let's say color, that the representations of them, the relations of those representations to other representations, which reminds me of a carousel of representations here, but nonetheless, those relationships appear to map onto the way that you and I understand colors in the real world. And so I think, I think I've heard Pavlik say that really, when it comes to LLMs, that question of quote unquote grounding, and I think that People are, are using that term in all sorts of different ways and probably taking it very far away from the sense in which you mean grounding. I, I didn't really push him on this when I spoke to him. And um, I think you've kind of pushed a lot further on that. But the, the referential grounding capacity seems, at least in the way he describes it, to be much more or much more a correlation. And I don't think really escapes that sort of carousel in the way you mean it. But I, I guess I'm curious to hear you think of, uh, comment on that a little bit. I don't know why he even wants to call it sensory grounding, or sorry, referential grounding. The referent of pig is a pig, or pigs. The referent of that piano I'm looking at is that piano over there. The connection we're talking about is between the word piano and that referent. Okay, there is no connection between that this the word piano and that referent causal connection. In 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 uh, it's just words and words. It's it's uh, both of these Moliere's view uh, and Molin is an is an ungrounded symbolic view. They think uh, uh, Molin thinks that the fact that these are their uh, uh, weightings of parameters and vectors involved rather than words means that it's no longer just words and words. But it's not what what uh, whatever what uh, whatever other symbols you connect symbols with. It's symbols and symbols. And the right connection is not symbols and symbols, but but in the case of words, is words and their reference. The referent is that. It's not the word that refers to that. It's that. And 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 as I said, the, the to get that kind of grounding, you have to have a lot of sensory motor capacity, which none of these models have. They're pure ungrounded symbolic models. Yeah, that that does feel feel right to me as well, and I think that. In our, our current models, one thing that a lot of people, including Molo Millier, are sort of calling out, and I personally think I'm in agreement with you and that, you know, uh, that really, this doesn't get us much further, but um, when there were sort of debates about the stochastic parrot picture of these GPT models, that they are simply predicting the next word and so on, um, well, maybe maybe I shouldn't be bringing stochastic parrots into this description, but okay, no, no. the that's, a, that's okay. It is it, it's all right to mention it there. Mm -hmm. But I guess the picture of an LLM is just a thing that predicts the next word that used to be true that is now a little bit less true. 
with the addition of reinforcement learning from human feedback. But as you've kind of already addressed that additional human feedback, you're just giving it, I mean, this is, we now have, you know, ranking models and maybe the LLM can output something that is a proposition and there's some evaluative sense in which the human is able to say, okay, this is true or false. You should give me this output as opposed to this output. But when we are addressing that question of, well, does that statement have meaning to the LLM? I guess, um, as it is with you, it's, it's not clear to me entirely that this endows it with any intrinsic meaning, because again, the LLM, and as you said to, I think, GPT-4, if your life depended on it, I, if I asked you to point out something that is red in the world, if I kind of endowed you with the capacity to point at things, you wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, well, I, I, this is less interesting because we kind of agree uh, about it. Um, I don't know why. Yeah, I think it, it boils down to mirror neurons. I think that, that they're so t- taken away with their interpretations of the symbols that they're dealing with is that they're, they're starting to believe it. And, they, and yet it's so easy to break out of that circle. You just have to say, can it for any of those or not for, for, not, for enough of those words? Is it able to actually um, uh, connect them with the object in the world, or can it just talk about it as if it were connected to, to the object in the world? I mean, that's so simple, right? It's a, it's a it's a simple operational criterion, and it's completely lacking in these. It's they're not T threes. If they were T threes that could do all the stuff they can do, and uh, were T threes. Then, then we'd have something to talk about. We'd, we'd then start worrying about whether they're feeling too, even though we can't prove it. But for these things, which are just symbol crunchers, no matter how you interpret them, leave out the interpretations, just like you leave them out of the math. What's going on there is just the symbol crunching. Well, on the other hand, let, let me to be more positive. It's, it, it, not only is it fun playing with ChatGPT, but it was thrilling to see that that much could be done by a symbol cruncher. And I started to wonder, what was it I mean, I, the, the anonymous person that, that I interacted with knows the answer to this, but I don't because, I, because I'm not an insider at, at, uh, at OpenAI or at Google or at, uh, anywhere. But um, how is it that they can do as well as they can do without understanding? That's the right way to put it, not try to figure out how it is that they understand after all. But they don't have understanding. And I'm not just talking about, yeah, I am just talking about sentience now. I don't know if I'm just talking about sentience. Maybe I'm just talking about uh, the full T3 capacity. They don't have any T3 capacity. So how come they can do so much without it? I understand how, if we talk about the, 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 the uh, dictionary graphs, if you reduce a dictionary to the smallest number of words from which you can reach all the rest of the words by, by um, definition alone, that that that's that that minimal grounding set is essential. You don't really have to see everything that you ever talk about. Or be, but but what would make the the a purely word word symbol symbol cruncher able to do all of the things that it can do, despite the fact that it's not a a T three a grounded T three. And I'm I, I'm drawing very tentatively. And this is this is just sort of provisional until I get more used to it. I think there's something about language itself, language itself. Um, one, of the, one of the threads that came out was that in what, what does it mean in, in Turing computation when we say that a symbol has an arbitrary shape? Um, the Saussure's idea that, that, um, that symbols don't resemble the thing that they refer to. That's true about words as well as mathematical symbols. I mean, it, well, it, it's even true about, about, about uh, successors when, when you, instead of saying two, three, four, five, you use the stupid notation of going zero, prime, 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 where it's, there is a resemblance because the number of primes is related to the, to the number itself. But uh, that's, a, that's an oddity and nobody, nobody does analog arithmetic. Uh, you can't, you, you can't do analog English or uh, if, I can't act out everything that I'm saying now either. But although at the word level, there is no similarity between the word and the referent, and so it's really a challenge to be able to, to ground something in their reference. At the proposition level, the cat is on the mat, 
it's still cat is an arbit arbitrary symbol mat is an arbitrary symbol uh the is a, a not even a content word it's it's a it's just a function word so it's purely syntactic etc nevertheless there is some structure there that do it doesn't resemble a cat on a mat but if you take a lot of sentences, the cat is on the mat, the dog is on the on the on the on the, on the table, the the table is on the dog, the the the, the uh, sun is on the on the west, etc. There is structure there reflected in the syntax, in the structure of the language, not the shape of the referent. So there is some shape involved there. The shape of a what? So what is a proposition? It's a it's a state of affairs. Uh, the, the way philosophers say is that snow is white is a proposition because there's a state of affairs and if and if snow is white then that proposition is true etc so there's states of affairs in the world that are correctly or falsely described by propositions and more even complex even more complex ones that's where chomsky comes into it too when he talks about universal grammar grammar and the and the uh, multiply embedded things you can say that are not as simple as the cat is on that but in any case there is structure there and that structure does resemble the state of affairs as structure. And maybe that's as much structure as you need, along with the algorithms and the, and the completion, etc., to get the con con coherent speech that you get out of uh, chat B T B B T three chat GPT-3. Does that make sense or am I stammering? It, it does make sense to me, yeah. One, one interesting connection here lifting us into the domain of images a little bit. And I've mentioned this this one to people before, and I think there's some kind of recent studies that bring this into interesting light, is the, the difference between some of the multimodal systems we have now. So specifically, I'm thinking about Dolly 2, where you have this contrastive learning procedure where you are sort of training the clip part of the model, the contrastive language image pre-training by this big process where I have an entire caption, an entire image, and I do contrastive learning on that. The correct caption and the image get closer representations and so on. But then you have these later models like Imogen that came on and that did not do this at all. In fact, they just used a very large text encoder in those models and those seemed more photorealistic, they performed better, which was surprising to me and a lot of people at the time. But I think another kind of component of this that interests me is there have been some recent studies, and I think particularly they were looking at CLIP and trying to analyze whether it had compositional understanding, which is, I think, a limitation a lot of people have been pointing out in studying. And they did find that these models that have been trained in CLIP-like ways are not really going to be able to have a sense of the difference between the man is riding the horse versus the horse is riding the man, or that's probably a dumb example, but something of that yeah, sort. Yeah, it's okay, it's the same, yeah. And you would kind of expect that, I think, from the fact that an entire caption and an entire image are being mapped together. You wouldn't really expect that breakdown. And I don't know that they studied other systems like Imogen, I would imagine, though, Kind of to what you said, in this case, we are kind of dealing with a pure text encoder and then integrating it into this larger system. So, so maybe there is something to that in the sense of the encoder has learned a lot about states of affairs in the world. And maybe that does a little bit more than this contrastive clip training where you're kind of dealing with this sort of brute caption to image level. I don't have like a full set of thoughts on that, but that was just something that was brought up for me as you were speaking. My, yeah, my hunch would be that it would be useful for these people not just to look at texts of everything, but look specifically and in a focused way on dictionaries, because, because there is a structure in those dictionaries. And if there is platonic structure behind some of the successes of chat GPT, it'll be there faintly in, di in dictionaries and especially in many dictionaries, so that to, to talk baby talk, Propositions are, for me, uh, a, a subject term and a predicate term, and the predicate tells you the features of the subject. Okay, that's and the features. I mean, there are all kinds of features, right? I mean, there there are sensory motor features, and they're highly, you know, way way up in the in the indirect grounding stuff as well. But if 
the the feature the, the fe you were talking about the, the 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 what did you call them the the the, the components or the co com components maybe dictionaries can tell us what the main feature vocabulary is out of which you can get a lot more and maybe that's part of the way that they get even more in discourse and even more with with um, with the, the, the completion algorithm etc it would just it would be like I isolating in a uh, you could do it also I suppose in Google space you could say you've got Google recognizing all these things and you're and it's not just recognizing all these things but also parts of things I, I'm suspicious of image-based uh, categories by the way I mean they work very well on images but the difference between the real world and images is that is that images are all individuals okay they may be images of the same kind so you can imitate what it's like learning to distinguish uh, apples from pears in the real world multimodally um, from uh, it, just distinguishing visual images of apples from uh, uh, visual images of pears but even there there's potentially a feature vocabulary that could be isolated because they're they're there are images of features too or 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 there are things that can be labeled as a feature of an of a of a of an object and not just as a as an object and so you could if you could parse visual visual probably visual space is the, is the richest if you could parse visual space in terms of the kinds of features you use in verbal space to define or describe things you might be finding what are the platonic structural elements that are really there yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Another kind of connection I'm, I'm sort of interested in here too is I think there's been, not just in the domain of regular multimodality, but when it comes to robotics, and I know that this is not coming anything close to the sort of system that you are really interested in, but it does seem like when you hook up large language models to things like robotic arms, as they did in SayCan, you can get the system to do things in the real world that appear roughly correct. Um, the sort of robotic affordances, you ask your system to find a sponge, say, and it appears to do roughly the correct thing. That seems to be a really interesting capability that we now have, even though I still think, you know, as you said, we're not anywhere close to a T3 passing system. I mean, we're not, we're not even at a T2 passing system. Yeah, but I think that the richness, the richness of the ungrounded uh, 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 GPTs, the richness is such that I would put more money on their verbal um, capacity than on their capacity as robots in a toy world, uh, you know, you know with, with just a few things and approximate. That's less surprising. I mean, that you've just got a few objects, okay? That could have been done completely by, by, by uh, supervised learning, visual, just purely visually, and you, they could be dynamic objects. If, in, if on the other side you have a really sophisticated word cruncher with a lot of platonic structure there in, in words, basically ungrounded platonic structure, it could find its, its toy, gr toy grounding in the situation quite easily. And more than you would expect, it would make the what's his name again? The one that the the, the guy who quit who uh, wanted to give, yeah, yeah. It it would impress him a lot. It would also impress the anonymous person that I'm talking about that I can't name, because the, the, what we fell out on and fell out what we disagreed on was whether GPT understands. He's dead convinced that it understands, like Lamont. I guess uh, coming back to the capabilities question, one question I had for you on this was you did mention that you are very impressed that with a system like a large language model that does not understand anything, how much it can do. And I think that there's maybe an argument some people might have that really to continue getting this to a system that exhibits maybe human level linguistic capabilities, maybe something like T2. All you need to do is keep going along the current direction. You just keep scaling these things up. What are what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that the current paradigm we're in gets us to something I close to T2? So. Not at all. As long as they're avoiding T3, they're, they're just, just rattling their symbols. Well, I'm not, it's not 
uninteresting. In fact, I'm going to probably spend months trying to figure out how it is that it's doing it so well. And what, and, and can I say the Chomsky angle on this? I, it was mentioned in it very cryptically in the Chomsky, um, just to quickly review this, there's, there's two kinds of grammar, universal grammar, which is, which is universal to all languages with a few parametric variations and ordinary grammar, which is learned in ordinary ways. And there's nothing special about ordinary grammar. And none, none of the things that Chomsky says is about ordinary grammar. It's about universal grammar, something that's true about all languages. What he says is maybe universal grammar, the, the syntax, this universal grammar, the syntax of universal grammar, what is well-formed and ill-formed according to that syntax is not really a syntactic matter at all. It's a matter of meaning and thinking in the sense, uh, in the sense that when there's a violation of a rule of universal grammar, a rule that the child could not have learned because the child was, was born knowing and feeling that, that, that a sentence that violates that rule is wrong. As soon as they learn enough language to have any language at all, they already don't make that kind of mistake. So it's something innate. And the question is, is it grammatical or is it um, cognitive in the sense that we think cognize to, to me, there's nobody that, that has given a better approximation of what cognition means than to the or, ordinary Anglo-Saxon expression thinking. We think, okay, that's what, that's what Descartes said. You know, you know, you're thinking when you're thinking, you can't, you can't doubt it, right? We think, okay. And there's some things that we can think, and there are other things that we never think because they're not thinkable. You know, I'm not talking about a logical contradiction like a square circle. That was what I said. I'm talking about um, I'm talking about what would have been behind a violation of universal grammar. Like you can say, John is easy to please. Uh, John is eager to please. John is eager to please Mary. All of those are fine, thinkable thoughts, but you can't think John is easy to please Mary. And that's not a violation of ordinary grammar. You need universal grammar to explain why you can't say John is easy to please Mary. Um, Chomsky says that one possibility is that, that what, what, what that grammatical structure would have reflected would have been a thing, a, an unthinkable, it would, it wouldn't, there is no thought that corresponds to the, to the thought John is easy to please Mary. It's an unthinkable thought. And if that's true, then maybe the fact that syntax itself, and by the way, uh, ChatGPT makes no UG errors and no ordinary error, ordinary grammar errors either. I mean, but it, it just swallows. It would, it would, just like it, it can become nasty and, and swear. If you give it a lot of text written by illiterate people that are making grammatical errors, people make grammatical errors, then it would make ordinary grammar errors, but they still wouldn't make, it still wouldn't make UG errors because nobody violates UG, okay? So everything there would be UG compliant syntax and maybe behind it there's some platonic relic of ug compliant thought that is also guiding chat gpt this is very vague but it's but it's a it's a, it's a hypothesis that's interesting i do want to kind of jump back to your comment earlier though that i guess when i asked you about llms and t2 your thought was if as long as we're avoiding T3, then it sounds like we're not going to get to a lifelong, even T2 passing system. If I, if why, I not? why not? Why not? Uh, we've, we've, we're going to get perfect translation too. That's all feasible. It's word, word land, right? Uh, why, why should we doubt it? I doubted it before. I thought it was because of you couldn't even get this far with, without a T3. And now I see you can so I don't see why you can't go the whole distance. Well, all that means, right? What does it mean? Nobody t says everything, but and, and nobody even understands everything. But to get it to the to the to the level that humans humans real humans do, or even smart humans do, why not? I think GPT. Yeah, I, if you know how to talk to GPT three, and I'm getting good at it psychologically, it's terrific. You really every time GPT three makes a mistake or misses something, give it to him like you would to a real person. Don't doubt. Just give it to him and he gets better. If I could just get him to stop um, 
apologizing <laughs> and, and saying, I'll get the GPT-3. It's a, if they could just drop those formulas, I don't need it. And if I could get them, this is really important, and I'm sure they'll do it. I need an, a, a session that's as long as I want, and he keeps updating because I don't know what the cutoff is. I haven't been able to figure it out, and he doesn't know it either. But but after a certain number of iterations or log or logins or whatever, it's a new session. He goes back to zero. He, he, he goes back to vanilla GPT-3. Three. And I would like to see it continue for longer. But once it's continuing longer and I know how to talk to him, I think, I mean, you can get, you can get actually, listen, there's nobody on the planet that knows as much as, as him. Um, but there's a lot of stuff he doesn't know. And there's a lot of stuff that he gets wrong. Fix it. Keep the, keep the, as you would with the person, keep it as, as good as he, as, as you can, at, I don't know everything either. But as we can do it, it'll be the it should be the best conversation I can have. Yeah, this is this is a bit of a tangent, but I do think it seems to me like unlimited length conversations with these systems are going to be unlikely to be offered. There's been some interesting recent work that's just kind of discussed the sort of issues with alignment for these systems and the fact that people can kind of inject them with prompts or sort of cause them to oh, be yeah. misaligned. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can. You can make them, you could, yeah, you can, you can, that's fine. That's true. Uh, I, I'm not asking them to incorporate my updates into the 20, 2021 corpus. I'm just wanting it to be incor incorporated into what we're interacting in. Of course, yes, there are, what I agree with, with this, with this anonymous person is, I think it's a huge danger. I think I, as, as excited as I am, uh, f about what it can do f for someone like me, I think it could do incredible amounts of damage. Brainwashing, misinforming, um, putting in biases, uh, uh, p uh, instilling paranoia, corruption and fooling. I mean, everything. It's, it's, it doesn't take imagination to all you can do with something that is... I think maybe um, a good kind of final set of questions here is we've been kind of skirting around a lot of questions related to sort of the different Turing tests, what is an appropriate thing to target. You said in your work that T3 for cognitive science is really the appropriate thing to target. And I think we've kind of settled on that in this conversation. And right now, it seems to me like really, we are just in this land, at least in artificial intelligence of we are developing useful systems. We are, at the moment, most of the field's attention is directed at language systems, something that could feasibly, with enough scale, with enough direction, maybe pass a lifelong version of, of the link, of the language-based Turing test, or T2. So I guess my, my question here is sort of more about a, a positive picture. So I know that you've kind of explored certain um, techniques for category induction with, with neural systems. And... I guess my question then is about what efforts are you kind of aware of or, or that you think about that are not avoiding the T3 question? I know you've thought about kind of hybrid neurosymbolic systems, that sort of thing. The, the, the T3 question is only, is only a problem for, for cognitive simulation, not for AI. I mean, if you want to make a T2 better and better and better as a tool, you've already made it too good for 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 the earth, for, for for safety so but uh, but there is something that that comes out of this uh, stuff that I'm doing that's that and I asked gtpt3 about it uh, four about it but um, when we do when we surprisingly when we model category learning uh, either in humans or well mainly in, in machines if we if we teach a machine patterns that are in, in two, two classes. We've, we've only worked on member and non-member, okay? Um, what happens is something analogous to what happens with human beings. It's called categorical perception. If you do a hard category, very hard, to, very, com, inter, very confusable in the beginning, hard, to, it takes a long time to learn and the, the features are hard to find, let's say, like a needle in a haystack. Um, what happens in the neural net models is not only the, 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 it gets better and better at categorizing, but it also, if you take the, the if you take the better trained net as it goes as it moves up in its in its in its uh, categorization capacity, and you look at its representation of members and non-members, 
what's what happens is in the beginning they're all scrambled up by representations i mean for for if you present uh, something and it's a, and uh, it, it'll light up certain units and not other units okay so there'll be a pattern of activity on the units and weights on the units and using those you can you can you can um, show in two dimensions how the how the members and the non-members of the category look before it started to learn or just after unsupervised learning and how they start to can you see me how they start to separate uh, and and the, the effect is that they that the members of the of different categories get further apart and more more compressed within the category that's sort of a side effect right even uh, nadal and bon there's there's a pair of modelers in in uh, in, in um, France who have published a paper on that just now. We keep finding it uh, in our models, and we also find it in human subjects. It's called categorical perception, the same thing that as they learn, uh, their, their, the differences between the members and the non-members become bigger. You can measure it by how similar they say they, they look or how discriminable, that's more psychophysical, how, how well they can tell them apart, and other methods, physiological methods we use. So this this pattern of, um, of categorical perception, let's call it, back to Worf, Worf and Worf hypothesis, the way it's slightly changing the way things look to you, the weak, weak Worf hypothesis, similar, it's similar in the change in the weightings to the kind of weightings that are happen, that, that, that change in the unground. I don't know the details of it because, because they're keeping it proprietary, but what happens in ungrounded systems like chat GPT-4, there's something similar happening. The question is, is there when I'm looking for some structural feature that is retained by propositions, does it also translate into, into something sensory motor, which it's still just squiggles and squaggles, but if it's, does it resemble the, the, uh, the, 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 the slight Worfian, uh, uh, what do we call it? Um, warping, warping of, of a perceptual space secondary to, learning to categorize, not really to verbalize, but to categorize. But we know that with human people, categorization has a counterpart and it's usually a word. That's really interesting. Since we're kind of almost getting to two hours here, I'll maybe leave us with a final question and we can close. And so hopefully after listening to this conversation, a lot of our listeners kind of have their interest peaked and maybe do want to learn a little bit more about for example, I mean, your work, I'm going to include a lot of links to that, but then also maybe related ideas on the ideas of reverse engineering cognition and what is kind of going on in the more cognitive science sphere, I suppose, as opposed to just AI that we're all thinking about. And so I guess my, my kind of final question here is then what directions and what kind of work do you think that people should be maybe paying more attention to that you feel just isn't seeing as much daylight right now? I, I've, I've mentioned it already. They should pay attention to much more attention to dictionaries and use them because they're special, right? And they should also look at the, the, the human performance work because that's surely, I mean, that's grounding in action, cate real category learning and, and real change in categorical perception. Well, Professor Harnad, it was really an honor to speak with you. Um, I appreciated the conversation and I really appreciate your work. It, it's not an honor. I'm a pygmy, but Turing and Chomsky are not. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.